laws of nature. If I throw a stick up in the air, it always falls down. If the sun sets in the west, it always rises again the next morning in the east. And so it's possible to figure things out. We can do science, and with it, we can improve our lives. Human beings are good at understanding the world. We always have been. We were able to hunt game or build fires only because we had figured something out. There once was a time before television, before motion pictures, before radio, before books. The greatest part of human existence was spent in such a time. And then, over the dying embers of the campfire, on a moonless night, we watched the stars. The night sky is interesting. There are patterns there. If you look closely, you can see pictures. One of the easiest constellations to recognize lies in the northern skies. In North America, it's called the Big Dipper. The French have a similar idea. They call it la casserole, the casserole. In medieval England, the same pattern of stars reminded people of a simple wooden plow. The ancient Chinese had a more sophisticated notion. To them, these stars carried the celestial bureaucrat on his rounds about the pole of the sky, seated on the clouds and accompanied by his eternally hopeful petitioners. The people of Northern Europe imagined yet another pattern. To them, it was Charles's wain or wagon, a medieval cart. But other cultures saw these seven stars as part of a larger picture. It was the tail of a great bear, which the ancient Greeks and Native Americans saw instead of the handle of a dipper. But surely the most imaginative interpretation of this larger group of stars was that of the ancient Egyptians. They made out a curious procession of a bull and a reclining man, followed by a strolling hippopotamus with a crocodile on its back. What a marvelous diversity in the images various cultures saw in this particular constellation. But the same is true for all the other constellations. Some people think these things are really in the night sky, but we put these pictures there ourselves. We were hunter folk. So we put hunters and dogs, lions and young women up in the skies, all manner of things of interest to us. When 17th century European sailors first saw the southern skies, they put all sorts of things of 17th century interest up there, microscopes and telescopes, compasses and the sterns of ships. If the constellations had been named in the 20th century, I suppose we'd put their refrigerators and bicycles, rock stars, maybe even mushroom clouds. A new set of human hopes and fears placed among the stars. But there's more to the stars than just pictures. For example, stars always rise in the east and always set in the west, taking the whole night to cross the sky if they pass overhead. There are different constellations in different seasons. The same constellations always rise at, say, the beginning of autumn. It never happens that a new constellation suddenly appears out of the east, one that you never saw before. There's a regularity, a permanence, a predictability about the stars. In a way, they're almost comforting.
the return of the sun after a total eclipse. It's rising in the morning after its troublesome absence at night, and the reappearance of the crescent moon after the new moon all spoke to our ancestors of the possibility of surviving death. Up there in the skies was a metaphor of immortality. Almost a thousand years ago in the American Southwest, the Anasazi people built a stone temple, an astronomical observatory to mark the longest day of the year. Dawn on that day must have been a joyous occasion, a celebration of the generosity of the sun. They built this ceremonial calendar so that the sun's rays would penetrate a window and enter a particular niche on this day alone. That kind of precision is a triumph of human intelligence. It outlives its creators. Today, this is a lonely place. The Anasazi people are no more. They had learned to predict the changing of the seasons. They could not predict the changing of the climate and the failure of the rains. But their temple continues to catch the sun's first rays on the summer solstice. I imagine the Anasazi people gathered in these pews every June 21st, dressed with feathers and turquoise to celebrate the power of the sun. These upper niches, there are 28 of them, may represent the number of days for the moon to reappear in the same constellation. These people paid a lot of attention to the sun and the moon and the stars. And other devices based on somewhat similar designs can be found in Angkor Wat in Cambodia, Stonehenge in England, Abu Simbel in Egypt, Chichen Itza in Mexico, and in the Great Plains of North America. Now, why did people all over the world go to such great trouble to teach themselves astronomy? It was literally a matter of life and death to be able to predict the seasons. We hunted antelope or buffalo whose migrations ebbed and flowed with the seasons. Fruits and nuts were ready to be picked in some times and not in others. When we invented agriculture, we had to take care and sow our seeds and harvest our crops at just the right season. Annual meetings of far-flung nomadic peoples were set for prescribed times. Now, some alleged calendrical devices might be due to chance. For example, the accidental alignment of a window and a niche. But there are other devices wonderfully different. Today, only the dry ruins of the great Anasazi cities have survived the ravages of time. Not far from these ancient cities, in an almost inaccessible location, there is another solstice marker, this one of singular and unmistakable purpose. The deliberate arrangement of three great stone slabs allows a sliver of sunlight to pierce the heart of a carved spiral only at noon on the longest day of the year. The wind whips through the canyons here in the American Southwest, and there's no one to hear it but us. A reminder of the 40,000 generations of thinking men and women who preceded us, about whom we know next to nothing, upon whom our society is based. Mm -hmm.